This video is brought to you by HelloFresh. Journal entry, June 15th, 2022. It is now day four of my viewing of the Alpha and Omega franchise, and I see now that I have made a terrible mistake. Barricaded in my office in order to prevent any contamination outbreaks, my rations have run thin. As I'm almost out of water, wild berry pop-tarts, and brain cells, I'm currently watching the sixth film of the franchise, and I do not know if it is my sanity eroding or if there are actual dinosaurs dancing on the screen with birds at a golf course accompanied by a water fountain musical number. Is, is this death itself? I also made the regrettable mistake of Googling the movie is with my safe search off. I bore witness to horrors that no human should ever have to suffer. It is my fault to think that I was brave enough to survive this eight movie onslaught, that I could make it to the end and use my suffering and research as a word of caution to all of mankind so our species could avoid descending into the spiral of madness. I fear that it is too late. I can hear her whispers now, and it is only a matter of time until the seal is broken and they escape. But yeah, no cap, this franchise sucks! Reviewing the Alpha and Omega franchise is easily one of the most requested videos in my entire YouTube career. I've had a guy email me for months, for almost four years requesting me to review the Alpha and Omega franchise. And I realize now that this individual is a jerk at best and a sadist at worst. Probably both. For those who don't know, the Alpha and Omega franchise is a descent into chaotic furry direct-to-video madness, with some of the most confusing stories, characters, and specifically animation I've ever seen. Take for example, this running cycle. You'd think something this bad would be the exception, but no, it's the status quo. And we see this caliber of content throughout the entire series. Well, except for like the first movie, which is serviceable, but just barely. Still full of other weird stuff though. <laughs> Save some for me. Bear Wars, Wolf Ghost, Beating Up Wolf Pups, Eugenics, Ancient Cursed Dinosaur Burial Grounds, I'm not making any of this up! And there are eight of these movies, eight of them! Y'all think the Lamb Before Time franchise is bad? Oh, oh, it's nothing compared to the Alpha and Omega franchise. At least those movies have somewhat bearable stories and songs and visuals with the first one being incredibly good. But if you think you're gonna get that with Alpha and Omega, oh, uh, th then, then you are truly forsaken. It's like the Land Before Time franchise is an airplane that took off and then nosedived over the years. But for Alpha and Omega, that plane never got off the ground. It just kept running forward and started to drill into the core of the earth. So for this video, my goal is to dive into this chaotic franchise and watch every movie from start to finish so I can truly understand why they even exist. Was the first movie good enough to warrant seven sequels? Or is this just a corporate attempt to sling some low effort fur bait to unsuspecting children and their parents? Also, is this franchise really as bad as people say it is? Or might there be something more to it for it to garner this level of perceived success? Oh, by the way, I asked my furry friend Rishi, who like does amazing art commissions, by the way, to watch all of these movies with me. You know, have a consultant on standby to verify if this franchise is just fur trash in disguise. She courageously and foolishly said yes. But then it dawned on me. Saber, you might have condemned her to death. What happens if none of my objectives are answered? That, that means that I made her suffer all of that pain for nothing. I'm a good friend. I'm Marge. And I'm based. <laughs> Hold on. Did he just say I'm based? <laughs> this is disgusting. This is awful in every way. If I could kill it, I would. Does Rishi make it to the end of this cinematic death march? Can I? Has anyone? 
Will I find the answers I seek, or is this just a pointless endeavor into the maws of death? Well, let's find out. Oh! The first Alpha and Omega film was released in theaters in September of 2010, and performed quite modestly considering the robust competition it was up against that year. Distributed by Lionsgate and produced by Crest Animation Productions, the movie cost around $25 million to make, but brought in roughly around $50 million at the box office. So it obviously did something right. For those who don't know, Lionsgate is a mixed bag when it comes to their animated releases lest we forget about Norm of the North and Food Fight. So I'd absolutely consider Alpha and Omega to be one of their stronger, higher quality titles. Though, uh, that's not saying much. Vera, get my lawyer. We're gonna copyright that roar and make it into a ringtone. Crest Animation Production, which is now defunct, has a wild history that can be its own video. But it was mainly known for its work on the Swan Princess franchise, another direct-to-video empire. There's actually a behind-the-scenes exclusive from Crest about the first Alpha and Omega movie, where the directors, Anthony Bell and Ben Gluck, talk about the process of making the film. Conceptualization, designs, the production workflow, stuff like that. It's actually kind of a bummer because some of these 2D drawings for the characters look pretty damn good and stylized, but none of them translated well over to 3D. One of the producers, Richard Rich, who is the founder of Crest Animation, comments on the importance of eyes with the characters and how that is an immediate draw for viewers, which is true, by the way. But these 3D wolf models look far too uncanny with their big eyes, which only get worse when the wolf pups arrive in the sequels. Look at them. Look them in the eye and tell me that they have a soul. And stop staring at me with them big old eyes. Now apparently, Alpha and Omega was originally supposed to be a much more dark and mature film with its tone. But allegedly, Lionsgate told the writers for the movie, Steve Moore, Ben Gluck, and Christopher Denk, to lighten things up so the film can be more easily marketed towards children. It's kind of wild to think that there might have been a timeline where this franchise was edgy and somewhat violent, and not this lame, bug-eyed crap. Voice actors for the original movie include Dennis Hopper, Hayden Panettiere, and Justin Long, though none of them would return for the sequels. Dennis Hopper actually passed away before the film was released and would be one of his final film credits. Their performances, though, eh, you know, they are fine. All in all, the first Alpha and Omega movie was able to find success, despite critics dunking on it with low reviews. But Alpha and Omega was not in the Oscar-winning business. They were in the franchise building business. Cousin businesses are booming. And I guess one could say that Alpha and Omega was also in the uh, bedroom eyes business too. I mean, come on. Kate, Humphrey, stop. I, I, I'm begging you, please stop it with those looks. Cut it out. The only thing more hungry than their eyes is me. That's right. It's, it's the sponsor. I gotcha. It's HelloFresh. What is HelloFresh? It's America's number one meal kit that makes cooking at home easy, fun, and affordable. How? Literally how? Shut up, I'll tell you. They deliver mouth-watering seasonal recipes and fresh, pre-measured ingredients right to your front door. No need to waste time at the grocery store or stressing about meal planning. Everything you need is prepared, delicious, and saves you time and money. I mean, Guys, those days happen. You're busy, and you just want a simple and satisfying meal that's easy to put together. Like, I'm literally having a day like that at this very moment of recording. So it is genuinely awesome to have meals from HelloFresh that are good to go. Follow the step-by-step -step recipe with the already pre-portioned ingredients, and boom! It's food time. Also, the meals are fantastic, with a ton of variety to pick from. And again, HelloFresh is a big time saver. That is a huge draw for me, since I'm usually in a time crunch with meal prep and would rather have something simple but tasty ready to go at the end of the day. 
No sacrifice on flavor, but all the added bonus of not wasting my time aimlessly wandering the corridors of the grocery store like some kind of labyrinth with grocers who are minotaurs. That's right, I'm saving my time during those busy work weeks. So folks, use my link or go to HelloFresh.com and use code POGSABER July 16 for 16 free meals across 7 boxes, plus 3 free gifts. Once you click, my description will live update to count up the purchases. Alright, back to the video. Prepare for furry pain. <sighs> And now, folks, we begin our descent into hell. The first circle, the original Alpha and Omega film in 2010. Easily the most competent film of the franchise, it sets the table for the nightmarish sequels to follow. Our main characters include Humphrey, an Omega wolf. He's silly, lighthearted, yet marginalized along with the other Omegas of the wolf pack because they're all considered weak and soft. Then we have Kate, an Alpha wolf and daughter of the pack leaders. She's more goal-oriented, disciplined, and serious. Humphrey here, unsurprisingly, has a crush on Kate, but the pack forbids the two from ever being close to one another. There's also something about Kate being betrothed to another rival wolf pack in order to prevent war or something like that. But then both Humphrey and Kate are captured by humans and are relocated to the dreaded Idaho in order for them to Repopulate the wolf population, yeah, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Sex. So the two team up in order to find their way home. Wacky hijinks, silly bird side characters with French accents, running from bears, and all while growing closer to one another along the way. At the end, a big pack war erupts over the failed arranged marriage because Humphrey and Kate want to be together. But that's interrupted by a, a caribou stampede. Wait, hold on. I've seen this before. Kate bonks her head. She doesn't die. The wolves decide to chill out when it comes to their pack laws. And the film ends with a semi-sexually charged howling ceremony. The end. All in all, a pretty predictable but harmless movie, with a story that is structured around archaic laws and the pack hierarchy of wolves. But apparently, Omega wolves don't even actually exist? Like, I was reading about it briefly, uh, there's something about how they were thought to be a thing but actually aren't. I don't know, I'm not a biologist. But wolf packs definitely have their pecking order, so I can see what this movie was trying to do with the dynamic between Kate and Humphrey and the other wolves in the pack. Could that narrative have been better? Yeah, sure. But there's no denying that the movie itself has a lot of fluff and lowbrow humor for kids, which, <laughs> by the way, is totally fine. It's a kid's film. But nobody, and I mean nobody, was quite ready for what was about to come. Alpha and Omega 2, a holiday adventure. Released in 2013, we got ourselves a Christmas movie right out the gate. By the way, the original writers for the film are now gone, and instead we have Tom Kane, who will be in the writer's driving seat for the remainder of the franchise. Hold on, let's uh, let's check out uh, his IMDb page here. Uh, oh, oh no. Oh, and for the record, all of these movies will be around 45 minutes in length moving forward. If you can call that a movie. So, you like the original main characters from the first film, huh? Well, that is too bad, because now their kids, by the way they have kids, are now the main characters. Stinky, Claudette, and Runt. Wow, uh, Stinky and Runt got screwed over with their names. Stinky and Claudette here are the alphas of the litter, and are more bold and adventurous, while Runt is the Omega who can uh, climb a tree. Like the sequels really want you to know that. Runt here can climb trees. This is amazing. Yeah. And as you all most likely suspect, the animation just drops in quality. Terrible run cycles, wonky physics, low quality textures, low quality background assets, uh, clipping, clipping everywhere, and then of course, the infamous Poop River. It all just looks so half-assed and unfinished. And that goes for the story too. Runt here goes missing, is kidnapped by another wolf pack, is rescued by his parents and siblings, and then they all celebrate Christmas at the same convenience store from the first movie where the owner tried to shoot Kate and Humphrey, but now gives them dog food, leaves the door open to his store, and then just leaves. 
What? Did he? From gunshots to free food. Go figure. Alpha and Omega 3 – The Great Wolf Games Released in 2014, the three wolf pups return and are now part of some wolf competition that is very poorly explained. Like, what's the, um, what's going on here? It's a, it's a running trial? Is that what, is that what it is? Just, just run. That's, that's actually what it is. Run. Why are you running? Why are you running? That's it. It's always running. As a matter of fact, 30% of this franchise is just the wolf pups running and 100% of it looks terrible. So Humphrey here trains his three pups and their bear and porcupine friend for the wolf competition. Oh, by the way, the bear cup was in the second film for like a second, and it had like a little kid voice, but now it sounds like Neil from Family Guy. Yeah, that'll work just fine. They're not birds, they are monsters. The competition goes down, some boy wolf has a crush on Claudette, his father threatens to beat him if he loses, there's a tie, and then the evil dad realizes that beating his child is probably not the best way to motivate him. That's the movie. Oh, and the stock sound effects. Mwah, wonderful. And I'm looking for a few good competitors for next year. And the composer for this movie, Chris Bacon, has decided to go all out with his compositions at all times. He is trying his best, and it's frankly too much. Alpha and Omega 4, The Legend of the Sawtooth Cave. Also released in 2014, this particular entry is arguably the best in the franchise besides the first film. The visuals are admittedly better but still looks somewhat rough. But the story is actually kind of interesting. In a nutshell, it's about this haunted forest where some ghost spirit protects this blind wolf named Daria. The wolf pups stumble across Daria one day and want to know more. They eventually discover that the ghost is Daria's mom who died while trying to protect her from other wolves who wanted to kill Daria when she was a pup because she's blind and weak. In the end, Daria is brought back into the pack, and the evil wolf who tried to, like, kill her as a pup gets killed by the mom ghost in some kind of, like, ethereal tornado of ghost power. <laughs> awesome. So I can only imagine right now y'all are going, Saber, you lied. You said that this franchise gets worse with every single film. Okay, hear me out, okay? They do. Sawtooth here is the exception, and it's actually kind of nefarious what they're trying to do. It's 4D chess from the Alpha and Omega franchise. They're trying to fool you into thinking, oh, it, 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 it could actually get better. When in reality, you're being dragged underwater and you come up above surface to get like one last breath of air before you're dragged back down into the abyss. And let me tell you how. Alpha and Omega 5, family vacation. Guys, this movie is like 20% flashbacks from the first film. Like they literally went back and dubbed over Justin Long's voice with Humphrey's new voice actor in order to do so. By the way, no shade to the new voice actors who are like working on this franchise. Ben Diskin, all right, you are a cinnamon bun. I, I saw you tweet me about this voice acting. You, you're doing the grind. You're doing the work. Same for you and like all the other voice actors who have to work on this. No shade. You're doing your best. And you're one of the very few good things about this franchise, okay? So you're precious and protected. The director and the writer, on the other hand, mmm. Released in 2015, this movie is just about the family running from hunters who are trying to relocate the wolves again. That's it. That's, that's the story. And the flashbacks are like Family Guy cutaway gags. Hey, Kate, remember that one time when I was uncomfortably turned on by you? Like, I don't even want to bother going any further. It's not necessary. Family vacation? More like Family Guy vacation. Ryan, look out! <laughs> and then there's Alpha and Omega 6 Dino Digs in 2016. At this time, Crest Animation was now dead, and Splash Entertainment had taken over production. Maybe the movie might be better, right? Yeah, uh, this was the one that broke me. I, I actually have, um, 
Get that? Notes in my hand from the film. And I'm just gonna try and improvise a synopsis here because trying to put my thoughts into a script wouldn't give justice to this dumpster fire of a film. Okay, here we go. It starts off by saying like 65 million years ago, a pink dinosaur is being chased by a T-Rex. They fall into a pit. There's some heavenly lights. We fast forward 65 million years into the future. It's the wolf setting. By the way, nothing changed. A bunch of people are showing up, humans, to dig into the dinosaur burial grounds or something like that. And there's a weird narrative of like, we shouldn't disturb nature, says one twin brother to the other. While the other twin brother's like, we need money. We spent money. We have to dig this up. So they're trying to dig it up. A hole is created. The pink dinosaur is like, oh, crickets, the light. And I'm like, wait, have you, have you been down there? for 65 million years? And then like, she's alive, but the bones of the T-Rex are like over there. And I guess the light, if it touches the bones, brings it to life. I don't know what the light is. I don't know if she's been waiting there for 65 million years. I would have just, just off myself by that point. But we learned that the raptor or the T-Rex, whatever her name is, it's Amy. And she like is discovered by the wolves and, um. The wolves are like, yo, it's a, it's a dinosaur in a tree. We're, we're hanging in a tree. How great is that? And, and then like the T-Rex the comes to life and there's like a musical number with like the, the goose and the duck who golf with the bluebirds and like some kind of Vegas like show number, some musical. Uh, Amy is like, like crickets. We have to like go places. The wolves are running with Amy and like the T-Rex the somehow comes back to life. The T-Rex just immediately goes after Amy. By the way, the eyes and the T-Rex and Amy look awful. They, they, they look so derpy. It just, it just doesn't work, especially when they look right at the camera. It's awful. This movie is like a fanfic. Out of, the entire franchise is like baby's first fanfic, but this movie in particular is thing happens, thing happens, thing happens, and it's a fanfic. Uh, that's all, it's a fanfic. It's what Jurassic World Dominion should have been. Bad run cycles. No, no logic, no consistency, nothing is explained. The T-Rex and the raptor join in with the other birds and dance around because they can't help it. Because I guess they're birds too. Dinosaurs are technically birds, at least some of them. And, and, and then like the heavenly light zaps away the T-Rex and we're told like it's actually like a time traveling portal magic. And then the bear, ah, I can't fuck. What is this movie? I probably just clipped my microphone so hard. I, uh, it's too much. And, and I'm even mentioning that like, Humphrey and Kate here are like brought around by some wolf realtor who's like, how about you move into this plastic cave next to a golf course? <laughs> this Kate, who's the alpha of her pack, decides just, hey, screw the pack. We're going to move to the suburbs into these plastic caves because that's what I'm about now. Oh, it's awful, folks. It, it is terrible. And to add insult to injury, comic sans in the credits because that's the life we're living. Dino Diggs is the biggest dumpster fire out of the entire franchise. It is pure chaos. Then there was Alpha and Omega 7, the big furries. <laughs> Uh, also released in 2016, Tom here decided to channel the energy of the Ice Age franchise and even has a squirrel at the start being chased around as it obsesses over a pine cone. Ooh. The story here is just a big old nothing burger. Uh, Kate and Humphrey go out to hunt. They get caught in the snowstorm. The pups go out to rescue them. The bears are the bad guys yet again. And then the family makes it home to the cave for their version of Christmas. So I guess that's two Christmas movies for this franchise. Oh, and the sound effect of the golf balls hitting the bad guys. It's like the horny bong sound effect though. So, you know, how appropriate. And finally, there's Alpha and Omega 8, Journey to Bear Kingdom. Released in 2017, we are now at the end of this franchise. And, and folks, like we're almost done. This is it. This is the movie that uh, we just need to be done with. And we can say that we watched this entire thing. And you would think that this movie would be just as hollow and effortless as the fifth, the sixth, the seventh. But for some reason, Tom here decided to finally dump some world building into the series. The Bear Kingdom is sending its queen and princess to the forest, but then a rival wolf pack arrives and treachery. The bear guards betray the queen and the wolf pups have to protect the princess bear. 
It's it's wild because up to this movie, the bears are just kind of mindless bad guys that just show up occasionally. But now they have like a kingdom and a sergeant at arms? And I'm beast. For some reason, the caribou care about the bear queen and so do the squirrels. <laughs> okay. And also there's something about the evil bear controlling the water. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that does not look like water. It looks like something else. At the end, the wolves team up with the good bears and fight back against the bad bears and the bad wolves and, and then win the day. We even get a Shrek-esque dance outro because why not? And that, folks, is a summary of the Alpha and Omega franchise. Oh, oh, I could have gone much more into these films, but that would have been cruel to you. Speaking of cruel, apparently, the director for the 6th, 7th, and 8th film, Tin Mulby, allegedly played with the idea of saying that the three main wolf pups are actually full-grown corgis, and that's why they're small throughout the sequels. That he even wanted to show some of the other wolf pups growing up while the main wolf pups stayed the same size just to mess with fans. Bro, that's delightfully evil. <laughs> But yeah, that did not happen. Also, there are no foxes or bunnies in this franchise, which is like really rare for a series that's based in the forest and also has furry tendencies. As far as the ninth film goes, apparently there was rumors of one called um, Tropical Vacation and that it was on the logo of Splash Entertainment's website, but that it was taken down. But it turns out that it was a fake logo that someone posted on 4chan as a joke. So. Have we been saved from entering the ninth circle of hell? Or is it just a matter of time? No matter what though, we are truly forsaken. And that goes double for Rishi, who by some miracle survived this experience from start to finish. Rishi, oh no, she's dead, oops. So what are my overall thoughts about this abomination of a franchise? Was I able to find the answers to my questions? Yep, I absolutely did. But in the process, it raised a few more questions. We'll get to those here in a moment. First off, was the original Alpha and Omega good enough to warrant this many sequels? Um, no, no. It's not a terrible movie, but it's far from good. But here's the thing about franchises. They don't have to be good. They just need to sell. Air Buddies, for example, does this to a terrifying degree. Like I watched the Air Buddies Halloween movie and it was bad, but that doesn't matter. Those movies aren't here to win Oscars. They're here to sell videos to parents and their little kids who just wanna watch the funny dog talk. And you know what? That's harmless enough. And that folks is the case for the Alpha and Omega franchise. The Talking Wolves? It works. Talking animals just work in general because they're universal and relatable. Why do you think there are so many animated movies and shows with talking animals as characters? Because literally everyone on earth knows what a dog or a cat or a fish is. Kids can connect the dots immediately. And that's a strength that many studios and companies lean into. But seven sequels? That's ridiculous. And you can tell that the writers had no idea what they were doing. That or they just did not care. Probably both. It's extra sad too, because I think that they could have built something at least semi-competent. You got this for a setting of wolf packs and other woodland creatures, which to be fair, the franchise occasionally uses for plot points, but it's incredibly inconsistent. Just scattered continuity that makes me go, Oh yeah, I remember that character three movies and two strokes ago. Like, at least The Land Before Time had the Great Valley and Sharp Teeth, who are the bad guys of the series. Except for Chomper, we stand for Chomper. But for Alpha and Omega, it's all over the place. It's the marginalized wolf pack from the north. Uh, it's the banished cannibal wolves from the south. Oh no, the bears are bad. Oh wait, no, they're not. Wait, no, actually they're good. Oh no, they're bad again. Hey, look, the wolves from the good guy pack are now randomly bad for some reason. And let me tell you folks, it does not help that the animators use the same models over and over and over again for the bad wolves. It is very confusing. I swear that there's one wolf model that was used like three times to be three separate bad guys in three different movies. 
It's Wolf Olympics. Okay, now it's running from humans because they're bad. Okay, wait, it's Christmas movie and the humans are good? Okay, well, hold on. Now there are talking dinosaurs for some reason. And now there's a bear kingdom with royalty and armies and they're fighting over water? What? <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I love unapologetic chaos, but not when the characters are predictable and boring. Stinky, Claudette, Runt, boring. Kate and Humphrey, boring. The bird side characters, I, I hope that Gaston gets you both. This entire franchise is simultaneously turbulent yet static, and that blows my mind. And once more, it could have done something constructive with its premise. The Alpha's lifestyle? The Omega's? Consistent world-building factions and other creatures? It was all right there in front of you! An easy layup! But you decided to cherry-pick random elements instead and leave the rest as wasted potential. <laughs> I can see it now. Uh, hello, welcome to Furry King. What can I get you? Yeah, uh, give me the talking bear with the lisp, uh, the porcupine who spins like Sonic, uh, the, the boyfriend wolf who disappears for like three movies, but then becomes important again in the fifth movie for some random reason. And yeah, give me some of those uh, uncomfortable bedroom eyes and sexual innuendos from the wolf parents. Thank you. So when it comes to Alpha and Omega across the board, there's nothing of quality in regards to its stories, its characters, its visuals, just nothing. But that doesn't matter, because little kids don't care about quality. They just go with what catches their attention. And it just so happens to be these big-eyed wolf pups with their homunculi faces and eyeballs. Eyeballs that are about to pop out of their skulls. Little kids like what they like. And Lord knows that I loved a ton of dumb stuff when I was growing up. I practically begged my parents for creepy crawlers. But there's no doubt that the folks behind the Alpha and Omega franchise provide the bare minimum when it comes to fielding sequels for this soulless franchise. A bit over the top, is it not? The young ones love it. Wow, she's hot! Now, to answer one of my other questions from the start. Is Alpha and Omega a corporate attempt to sling fur bait to unsuspecting viewers? Uh, mostly no. Let me explain. Rishi here, my furry friend consultant, said that this franchise was most likely the furry awakening for some of its viewers, but that the franchise itself wasn't created solely for that purpose. That's like saying that The Lion King was deliberate fur bait because some furries got their start with that movie. Yeah, that's why the movie was obviously made. And why it almost broke $1 billion at the box office, right? Because furries, <laughs> it only makes sense. If anything, furry awakenings are just byproducts of companies and studios making content with broad appeal. Believe it or not, a majority of people love anthro and animal characters, but wouldn't call themselves furries. Yeah, there's a small portion of people who do, but I would not call them a targeted demographic when it comes to the Alpha and Omega franchise. That being said, does Alpha and Omega have characters and designs and traits that furries enjoy? Oh, absolutely. And I wouldn't be surprised if there are some furries who work on the films. But again, the use and popularity of animal and anthro characters is nothing new. And I doubt that the executives behind Alpha and Omega are plotting otherwise. I could see it now, when they're sitting in their boardroom. We gotta get those fairies and their money! Quick, make Kate's bedroom eyes larger. Yeah, more. By the way, uh, Rishi brought up another thought that I hadn't considered. Was the Alpha and Omega franchise the leftover remains of a failed cartoon pitch? Y you know what? I think so. It's possible, since the movie plots are stretched out and disjointed. But you know what? Who can say? To think? That there was a universe where Humphrey could have had a cartoon crossover on Nickelodeon with Jimmy Neutron? Oh, that could have been amazing. Oh, Jimmy, look at the pretty wolf girl. I'm gonna pet her and- ah, She's biting my arm, Jimmy! In conclusion, the Alpha and Omega franchise is undeniably a terrible descent into coincidental furry madness. As someone who routinely suffers from watching some of the worst animated movies ever made, I have to admit that witnessing the entirety of this franchise was akin to falling down a staircase through each circle of hell, with every level somehow growing worse in its own particular way. 
Now, keep in mind, there are nine levels of hell in total, and there are currently eight Alpha and Omega movies. If fate is truly cruel, that means there's one more film that needs to be released in order for the ritual to be complete. Only then can Google Images Kate unleash her plague upon the world. Over the top rhetoric aside, the Alpha and Omega franchise is essentially a bunch of low quality, low effort movies specifically designed to distract little kids as their parents throw on a film to shut them up for an hour. That's what it is. Just dangling some subpar furry keys in front of their eyes. Their big stupid wolf eyes. Now there's nothing wrong with that inherently. Lord knows, I watched a bunch of low-tier animated movies and shows when I was a little kid. But there are much better alternatives out there that offer actual substance and competent visuals. The Balto Trilogy comes to mind. And though it's not perfect, it is superior to Alpha and Omega. Oh, and I feel that we all collectively owe the Land Before Time franchise an apology. Yes, it's bad, but it's not Alpha and Omega bad. So if you're looking for some bad movies to rip on with your friends, then maybe, maybe I would suggest the Alpha and Omega franchise, specifically the dinosaur entry. But if you're going to these films, hoping to find something of redeeming quality, then you are truly forsaken. And you will find yourself up a tree again and again and again.